Hey everyone, uh, this is going to be the start of me documenting what I expect to be a diagnosis and then living with functional neurological disorder, FND for short. Um, so I guess this all started about three months ago when I experienced a tingling in my foot, which then when the tingling went up my leg, you know, up the rest of my body and produced an electric charge, not like a shock, a charge. It was pretty aggressive in this area of my head just here. Um, I was fine after that for about a week and then I got the same charge feeling in my head uh, a week later, which then resulted in aggressive shaking in my legs. I went to sleep, clearly slept it off and I was fine for another week. And then bang, happened again. Um, my whole body tensed up. I was laying in bed. My whole body tensed up. You know, my legs were shaking. That was on the Wednesday night. Thursday, Friday, I, I didn't feel right compared to the other times when it had happened and I felt fine. Um, in the days afterwards, I didn't feel right on Thursday and Friday. I felt jaded, a little bit dizzy. Um, I, you know, I booked a doctor's appointment for the Saturday morning. Um, I woke up Saturday morning and my whole body was shaking. I could not move. I, my my legs were numb. I could not move whatsoever. Um, so I called 111. They said, come in, you know, we'll give you an out of hours emergency appointment. I went into the hospital and I remember just everything. Like, I'd never experienced vertigo like it. Um, everything was spinning. You know, I was thinking, I was thinking the worst at this point. I was thinking I've even got a brain tumor. You know, there's a hemorrhage. Because it was neurological, I knew that it was an issue with my head. That's what made me worry even more. If it was something physical, you know, like a pain in my stomach, a pain in my leg, then, you know, I think I would have been able to deal with it a lot better. But, you know, I was extremely worried. I saw a doctor there and he told me that I could go to A&E, but there's no neurologist on site, so they're just going to do my bloods. And, you know, I'm probably not going to get an answer. He didn't really sell the idea of me sitting in A&E for six hours for no reason too well. So I decided to go home. Uh, I felt, you know, I felt strange for the rest of that day. I, I woke up on Sunday, I wasn't feeling good still. And um, I was laying in bed and I remember getting this tingling sensation in my face. Both my arms and my hands went completely numb. I couldn't feel them. And, um, my legs were shaking aggressively and I thought, I'm about to have a stroke. That's what I thought. I called an ambulance out, ambulance done, ECG, um, which looks at your heart and, you know, blood pressure, blood sugar levels, everything was okay. They said, you know, it just seems like a panic attack. And, you know, at the time I, I thought it's much more than that because I've had anxiety, I've had depression before. I've never experienced anything like this. So they told me to go to my GP to the next day and um, go from there, really. So I went to my GP and I remember walking in. I was so dizzy. I thought I was going to collapse. I had to beg them to give me a bed to lay down in. So I laid on the bed. A doctor came in, assessed me. He said, you need to go to um, A&E um, and have a CT scan. So I went to A&E. Uh, waited for four hours and I told the doctor in there that I used to smoke cannabis to relieve migraines. I used to get migraines quite frequently. So I told the doctor in there that I used cannabis. I stopped quite recently. And um, two weeks later, this charge feeling in my head started. And I now regret saying that to him because he clutched straight onto that. My CT scan came back fine. He said it must just be withdrawal symptoms from the cannabis, which I knew was, you know, complete nonsense. But I was feeling a little bit better. So, you know, I was optimistic that this was just a little blip and nothing more would happen. Um, and after experiencing that severe vertigo, I remember the next day I woke up and I felt fine. I felt absolutely fine. Like nothing was wrong with me. And then by the end of the day, I got that tingling in my foot again. And then 
slowly throughout that week, I started to get tremors um, in my legs. I was waking up aggressively shaking. And, you know, at this point, I realised that there was something going on that just wasn't right. And then my vision went blurry and I foolishly looked up. You know, I believe that it was nerve damage. I believe that it was something nerve related because of the tingling sensations. And I stupidly tried to self-diagnose myself uh, with the help of Google. And I saw that I ticked a lot of boxes for MS, for multiple sclerosis. So I went to my GP, I said to my GP, I think I've got MS. She said, you know, what are your symptoms, blah, blah, blah. She said, did your vision go? Did, did your vision go blurry? And I told her that it did. And she kind of saw that as a definitive factor to, for me to be investigated for MS. Um, so she sent me for an MRI of my head. Um, just checking if I've missed anything out because there's so much happened. Um, yeah, sent me for an MRI of my head. Sat down with the neurologist afterwards. I had to pay for a private appointment because otherwise I would have had to wait six weeks to discuss my results, which, you know, I was anxious. I wasn't I wasn't going to wait six weeks. I'd much rather pay £250 and just get the answers there. And then, unfortunately, that's the way the world works. If you pay, you get treated first. You get treated as a priority, which is wrong. But, you know, anyway, uh, the neurologist said that there was some white matter signal intensities on my MRI, which she believed were age related changes. I'm 22. So she believed that it was, you know, my brain still developing essentially. And there was some flare, which she put down to a psychological issue. You know, as I said, I've, I had a, had a couple of family bereavements and, you know, health problems in the past which probably caused you know a hell of a load of anxiety the migraines that i previously mentioned it probably caused all of those things um but it was evident on my mri that you know i had a psychological issue and she said you know but there's nothing conclusive that suggests that you've got ms from this mri so i'm going to send you to adambrooks hospital i was being treated at bedford i'm going to send you to adambrooks hospital where you have a lumbar puncture uh, where they draw fluid from your spine and they can see, um, I, I don't know what it is exactly, I'm not going to pretend that I do, but it gives them a definitive answer if you have MS or if there's another condition where your central nervous system, you know, is attacking itself, essentially. Um, so I was waiting four weeks for, um, four weeks for the lumbar puncture. And in this time, I, I noticed that my symptoms were getting progressively worse. Um, it, every morning it felt like there was electricity running through my body. Um, it's, it's a strange feeling. It really is. Um, from my head down to my toes, it felt like there was electricity. Um, but that electricity like feeling inside me slowly creeped towards um, parathesia. And it was like, pins and needles in the side of my head. I still get it now and I would say it's probably my worst symptom. Um, tingling in the back of my head, numbness across the whole of my head. My head feels heavy, it's horrendous. When you, when that coincides with vertigo as well, it, it really does stop you from doing anything. I was bedridden for three, three weeks. I could barely get up, I could barely wash, I could barely do anything. Um, yeah, it was dreadful, absolutely dreadful. And um, then I started to get chest pains, more severe. Um, it was like my ribs were digging into my stomach and, you know, I became more and more adamant that I did have MS and that um, this was the MS hug, as they call it, the tight girdling around your chest um, is a symptom of MS became more and more convinced that I had MS. Um, I was waking up in the night shaking. I had tight chest pain one morning and it, you know, it was getting tighter, tighter, tighter and it felt like it was reaching climax and I had to call an ambulance out. And I remember being on the phone to my friend and I said to him, it was so bad, I genuinely thought I was gonna have a heart attack that day. 
And I remember saying to him, look, man, if anything happens to me, you know, I love you. Like, you know, it was, it was that bad that I genuinely thought I was going to die there and then. <clears throat> anyway, he came out, the ambulance, and he said, you know, seems like you've had a panic attack. Um, it just happened from nowhere. So I just presumed that, you know, that could be the case. Um, I didn't feel anxious, but subconsciously, perhaps, yeah, I was extremely anxious. I wasn't anxious about the fact that I might have MS. That really didn't bother me. But the feelings in my head, um, the tingling, it's like a fuzzy sensation across my forehead, tingling, just abnormal sensations in my head, like all the time. It's settled down a little bit now. Um, I have found people who do experience the same thing. And one thing I will say, if you're watching this and you're thinking, Shh, I experienced that as well. The only thing that I've found that alleviates those is lorazepam or Ativan, whatever they call it outside of the UK. Lorazepam is an anti-anxiety medication, but it also suppresses your central nervous system. Um, and that is the only thing that stops the parathesia in my head. That is literally the only thing. And doctors hate prescribing it. It's addictive, you know, all the rest of it, but it's the only thing that I've found that's helped that particular symptom. And yeah, anyway, um, next day I was with my friend and I got severe, severe tingling at the back of my head. And again, I thought I was gonna have a stroke. I called the ambulance, ambulance came out. And what, what they'll say is there's nothing acutely wrong with you. I can take you to A&E and you can sit there, but it's not likely that they're going to do anything for you. So I've obviously the feeling eventually passed and then the next day it would start again. You know, it would last for about three hours, four hours, just intense pain in my head. Um, yeah, they just there was just nothing that the ambulance um, and the paramedics could do because as I said there's nothing acutely wrong with me even you know they wouldn't admit me into hospital because there's nothing that they can do there and then I'm being investigated for MS so they see that I've already got something in the pipeline so there's nothing that they'll do to help me um, yeah anyway so I continued to be bedridden until I had to go to Adambrook's hospital for the lumbar puncture and I was extremely nervous about having a lumbar puncture. I'll do a separate video on what to expect. Um, but what I will say is that it was completely painless and, you know, I didn't, I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel any pain afterwards. You know, I was fine, basically. It, it was nothing. It was completely minor. Um, so if you are told you're having a lumbar puncture, uh, don't read people's horror stories about it because I promise you, you know, obviously it's going to be different for each person, but I can assure you that my experience of it was, you know, the blood test after it hurt more than the actual lumbar puncture. Um, so, yeah. And then my vision started to get even worse and it was, I didn't, I never went blind at all, which I hear people, or which I hear stories of people going blind in one eye and um, similar symptoms to that. It was it's just like fuzzy. My vision was extremely fuzzy, blurry, patchy. That's how I would describe it. And the parathesia started getting worse and worse and worse. And, you know, my head was just absolutely horrible. It felt horrific. Um, anyway, I woke up at three o'clock one morning and I just couldn't breathe. I was gasping for air. I had tingling in the back of my head and I called an ambulance at three o'clock and I said, you know, whether they're going to treat me or not, I need to go into hospital and I need to get something. I need, I need the hospital staff and the doctors to see me whilst I was at my worst point so that they could, you know, try and decipher what was wrong with me. At this point, I was still adamant that it was MS. I spent weeks and weeks and weeks saying, you know, I've got MS, you know, just that I expected it. Um, anyway, I told the doctor in A&E that I was being investigated for multiple sclerosis and could she call Adam Brooks, because I was at Bedford Hospital, um, to find out the results from my lumbar puncture. 
And I remember she came in and I was sat on the bed and she said, right, um, I've just spoken to Adam Brooks. I remember my heart was racing. And um, she said, there's, they said, there's nothing to suggest that you've got MS. Most people at this point would be, you know, delighted. But I was in a bizarre predicament where I was confused, worried, you know, upset. Because I just, I just didn't have a clue what it could be because no other... No one else had, you know, no other medical professional had given me an alternative to what it could be if it wasn't MS. That was the only thing that I was led to believe that it could be. And um, she said, you know, we're going to have to send you home. There's nothing acutely wrong with you. And I said, I can't go. I couldn't even move. I couldn't walk to the toilet. Um, I said, you know, you need to do something for me at this point because this has been going on for eight weeks at this point. So she reluctantly spoke to another doctor and they put me on the acute assessment ward and the neurologist couldn't see me after two days. I had an appointment. This was on the Wednesday and I had an appointment, an outpatient's appointment with her on the Saturday to discuss my results from the lumbar puncture. So they eventually, they admitted me for two days and then made me leave. Um, I left on the Thursday uh, because the neurologist couldn't see me and they didn't want to risk me getting an infection. Anyway, on the Friday, I woke up, I couldn't breathe properly. It, it was like I had to retrain my body how to breathe. It, it was bizarre and I had the feelings in my head again. Um, yeah, the feelings in my head, the tingling in my face and I had to call an ambulance again. Took me into A&E. You know, they've done the same tests and they said to me, it just seems like you're suffering from severe anxiety. You know, I think it's a psychological issue that you've got. And um, I just knew that that wasn't the case. And it's so difficult. And I know that many people who have FND have been through this. It's so difficult when I look all right, you know, you can't see that there's something wrong with me. But I can, I feel in myself and I know that the way I'm feeling isn't right and it isn't the cause of anxiety. It's, it's not. Um, I think that when doctors can't put it down to something, they'll latch on to, you know, they'll latch on to something else that it seems it could be that just to, you know, I felt fobbed off for a long time. And then I saw my neurologist on a Saturday and she said to me, the parathesia in your head is from anxiety, which, you know, I knew was just not true um she said she's going to send me for a spinal mri which i had yesterday um she done reflex uh she done a reflex examination on me and she said that that could indicate a functional neurological issue and that was the first time that i'd heard because obviously i googled that then that was the first time that i'd heard of fnd and i thought I joined a group on Facebook and if anyone else is in the situation of thinking that they've got FND, join the support groups on Facebook because there's some great people in there who will, you know, help you and will support you. And I found that a lot of my symptoms overlapped with, with theirs as well. You know, I found a lot of common denominators. Many people said that they'd experienced the electric charge through their head, the strange feelings in their head, the numbness in their legs, the tingling in their face the tightness in their chest, um, you know, it gave me a lot of reassurance that that's what it was. So where I'm at now is, uh, yeah, just had the spinal MRI yesterday. I presume that my neurologist is going to look at that and um, rule out any conditions that could be caused from that. And I'm hoping then I will get an official diagnosis of FND because... Just, uh, just for my sake, just for clarity, you know. But then you, you're still at a crossroads because it's a chronic condition that has no cure. It's similar to MS. Um, and, you know, when you talk to people about FND, I think that people just have the connotation that it's, they've not heard of it. But whereas if you told them that you had something like cancer, which is obviously, you know, I've lost people close to me with, from cancer because of the connotations that 
a disease like cancer has, and the main connotation that people have with it is death, then, you know, if other conditions people don't see as severe, but FND is something that you have to live with each day, and, you know, so is MS, and I don't think, and I'm saying this from the perspective of before I was being investigated for both of these uh, illnesses, you know, I didn't know much about them, you know, I was ignorant to how people struggle to live their life through these diseases and it's something that I think definitely needs more recognition because they're horrendous, they're absolutely horrendous illnesses and, you know, people who are fighting them, um, because there's people who, you know, have, I would say, a tougher time with their symptoms than I do and mine are extremely bad at times, you know, these people are you know, real heroes and they deserve a lot of credit because each day they're fighting just to try and live a normal life and, you know, that's what I've found myself doing now and, um, you know, I just hope that if this teaches one person who, you know, isn't familiar with FND, you know, how much someone with FND, MS, all these autoimmune diseases goes through and obviously there are, there are others that I've not mentioned which please feel free to comment below you know, an illness that you have that you don't feel, you know, is appreciated for how difficult it is to live with. <clears throat> but yeah. Um, so next step will be getting the results of my spinal MRI and then going from there, really. Uh, medication wise, like I say, lorazepam is the only thing that I found that really helps me. I'm on 40 milligrams of amitriptyline at the minute at night, which does help me sleep. Um, I'll do separate videos. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a weekly vlog on progress, on setbacks. Um, you know, I want it to be as authentic as possible. I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. You know, if I have a really tough day or a really tough week, which I am most weeks at the minute, then, you know, that's what I'm going to document to you guys. And I'm also going to do separate videos on, you know, what to expect when you go for an MRI, what to expect when you go for a lumbar puncture. Um, you know, suggestions on fast tracking your route to a diagnosis from my experience, from the experience of people that I've spoken to, because it is a long winded process, you know. I, I probably won't get diagnosed for another few months, it could, could take years, but you know, just I just don't want people to be in the same boat as me. And other things such as dealing with the anxiety, uh, dealing with depression, videos on things that have helped me with my symptoms, videos on things that have helped other people with their symptoms, things that have triggered symptoms and so on and so forth. But, you know, I really appreciate if you could subscribe and, you know, follow me on this journey and see, uh, see what happens, I guess. But yeah, thanks for watching.